I'd like to welcome uh, Edgar Francis, who is uh, our guest speaker for this evening. He's out of our history department, and he's going to be speaking on the Middle East 10 years after 9-11. And he's got a very interesting background. Um, in the picture that's on the brochure that you have, uh, we cropped his hat out of that picture. <laughs> Usually if you see him, he has this, looks like a Panama hat that he wears. But uh, it's not in that picture, and honestly, after I thought about it for a while, I didn't know you that well, I kind of felt like maybe we should have left it in there because I see you that way and I don't even recognize you without that hat anymore. So I apologize for that. But having said that, um, we call him, professionally call him Gar Francis, and he is, uh, has been studying the Middle East now for over 20 years. And he's lived in Cairo and in Tunis. And he holds bachelor's and master's degrees in Near Eastern Studies. And in 2005, he uh, finished his PhD in Islamic Studies at UCLA. He teaches Middle Eastern history on the campus, he's in the history department, he teaches Islamic history, and he teaches world history as well. And he's originally from Cape Cod, and we ch chatted a little bit about that. Um, interesting part of the country, uh, how he got interested in Middle Eastern studies is something that I'm sure he'll talk about in his lecture. So I'd like to present Edgar Francis, and the title of his lecture is The Middle East, 10 Years After 9-11. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Chris, for that introduction and for giving me something uh, to talk about at the, at the very last minute. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, since, you know, since he insisted, uh, my interest in, you know, in Middle Eastern studies does actually bear some, some relation to some of the facts that he, he related to me, uh, related about me. Um, as he mentioned, I grew up in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, that that part of the country is home to many you know, many families that are descendants of Portuguese fishermen, and that included my own family. Uh, so when I went to college, and I knew I wanted to study other people, other peoples, and other languages, um, I ended up drifting towards. Arabic, uh, because you know, because of the long-standing Arabic influence in the Iberian Peninsula, uh, a topic perhaps for another evening. Um, at the time, I was doing that within within the linguistics department, uh, th which required the study of a foreign language. So that's where Arabic came into the deal, and I quickly discovered that I hated linguistics and loved Arabic. Um, uh, and, you know, and my study abroad experience definitely cemented my interest in the field and, uh, you know, and in academia ge you know, generally. Um, you know, on, a, you know, on a more somber note, I think any discussion about 9-11 does end up being very personal. 9-11 you know, is one of those events where years afterward, you know, you know where you were. Um, Since then, uh, as a professor of Middle Eastern Studies, pardon me, every year um, when I'm talking about my field, that date rolls around and and I feel like I'm stepping in someone's grave and it's early enough in the semester that I can't you know, I feel like it just doesn't work to talk to my students about those events you know, that, you know, that early, even though this is an event that is known 
by its date. Um, so, you know, tonight, you know, as a part of this series of events that Dean Sermo mentioned, um, as many are remembering and commemorating those attacks in different ways, um, my goal is to do what I can and share my, you know, my expertise to call attention to the consequences of the American response to the September 11th attacks. Um, because of time constraints, and I timed this not planning to break down up here, <laughs> um, I will be focusing primarily on events in Afghanistan and, you know, and Iraq. Uh, you know, those, are, those are the areas where the American invol you know, in involvement or the American response to 9-11 was, was, of course, most, uh, you know, most marked. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time giving some background to the events, particularly circumstances in Afghanistan and Osama bin Laden's background. And from there, uh, I want to talk about the American response, uh, particularly the invasion of Afghanistan and then the, the, the invasion of Iraq. Um, so as I start with background, Historians are notorious for tracing back causes to prior events. Um, I will therefore resist the urge to start my talk with the end of the First World War <laughs> and um, try, to, you know, try to speed things up and get to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in the, in the 1980s, which I, th I think is a good place to look at the development of, you know, of these events. Um, during the 1980s, uh, you know, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and the United States all supported uh, Islamic militants coming from the Middle East and elsewhere to fight the Soviet occupation. Um, and one, you know, one of those who came to support the cause uh, was the Saudi-born son of a Yemeni contractor uh, a man by the name of Osama bin Laden. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, initially, uh, bin Laden was involved in funneling aid to these foreign fighters known as Mujahideen, that is to say, those engaged in jihad. Um, and, uh, and by 1986, bin Laden was building his own fighting camps in Afghanistan and was a leader of a group that he called the Firm Base, or in Arabic, Al-Qaeda. Um, uh, in 1989, the Soviet Union withdrew, and, and actually the uh, late 80s and early 90s were, you know, were a time of a number of important, uh, important developments. Uh, I'll talk about the, one of these, the first Gulf War, uh, in more detail a little bit later. But basically what happened is, in Afghanistan, the Soviets withdrew in 1989. Um, in 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait, and the United States, uh, you know, through the United Nations, gathered together a coalition to drive Saddam Hussein's forces out of Kuwait. To Osama bin Laden, who had been this uh, foreign fighter in, you know, in Afghanistan, this was an outrage and ultimately a potential threat to the sovereignty of Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states. Um, because of his, his opposition, to, the, you know, to this move, and ultimately his support of terrorist actions against the United States. Uh, Osama bin Laden was forced to leave Saudi Arabia 
first for Sudan and ultimately to Afghanistan in 1996. By that time, uh, there was a new regime in Afghanistan. Uh, the Soviet withdrawal had been marked by civil war, essentially, among the, the Mujahideen. But by 1996, a new militant group uh, <coughs> took power in, in the country. Uh, that group was the, you know, was the Taliban. Um, so by the, you know, by the late 90s, bin Laden was operating out, out of Afghanistan. Uh, and he was suspected of funding or supporting numerous attacks on American interests throughout the world. Uh, and it was, of course, from Afghanistan that bin Laden uh, planned the, the attacks of September 11th, 2001. You've been reminded several times this week, I imagine, that those attacks killed approximately 3,000 people. Uh, and these attacks horrified the world and briefly united much of the world in solidarity with the United States and in support of the United States. Um, almost every government in the world, including most Middle Eastern governments, condemned the attacks and they condemned terrorism in, uh, in general. Uh, the United States had been uh, engaged in attacks against bin Laden uh, during the 90s uh, in retaliation for different smaller attacks like uh, the bombing of embassies in Kenya uh, or, the, or the bombing of the USS Cole. But after 9-11, uh, the United States and, you know, and international partners uh, launched major airstrikes on, you know, on Afghanistan with the goal of basically eliminating bin, you know, bin Laden and, and his organization. Uh, by November of 2001, by the middle of the month, uh, Kabul was no longer in the, in the hands of the Taliban. Uh, <clears throat> former Mujahideen, known as the, the Northern Alliance, who uh, had never submitted to the Taliban, they basically acted as ground troops while the U.S. and its, and its allies um, acted as, you know, as the Air Force. And you know, American Special Forces were on the ground, but most of the forces on the ground were from the Northern Alliance, from these, um, you know, these former Mujahideen. By the end of that year, by the end of 2001, an interim government was established in Afghanistan, ultimately leading to a new constitution and new, new elections. Um, so the Taliban, notor you know, a, a notorious uh, government for their, uh, for their harsh application of their own extreme version of, is of Islamic law, they were no longer in power. You had, you had a constitution and you had elections. Uh, but I don't need to tell you that that did not solve Afghanistan's problems. Um, when an Afghan parliament finally opened, uh, it was dominated by warlords and strongmen. Um, American allies, including the, uh, you know, the sitting Afghan government of Hamid Karzai, has had incredible difficulty in the last 10 years controlling any territory outside of Kabul. Um, corruption and opium production, of course, have, have been rife in the, you know, in the last 10 years. Um, and the very recent past uh, has seen an, you know, an upsurge in violence. Um, you know, uh, President Obama, in his election campaign, uh, promised to focus more on Afghanistan, and he has certainly de you know, delivered in terms of more troops, uh, you know, more observation drones, and more strikes against, uh, against militants. At the same time, the Taliban have also been stepping up uh, their attacks. Uh, 2010 was the bloodiest year ever for coalition forces. Uh, and civilian casualties in Afghanistan 
are at their highest level since the Taliban was, you know, was toppled. Um, and I should say in, in, term, in terms of those deaths that uh, early on you may have heard about many civilian deaths caused by uh, the United States and, and its allies. Uh, in the kind of war they were fighting, civilian deaths were, you know, were, were absolutely inevitable. Um, and those caused a great deal of anger. Uh, but now most casualties uh, to civilians are from, you know, are from insurgents. And the Taliban, uh, who never went away, they, no, they stopped ruling, they withdrew from Kabul, they kind of melted into the, into the countryside. Um, you know, the Taliban remains a, uh, you know, a serious threat to the, you know, to the security of, you know, of Afghanistan. Um, so that's, you know, you know, that's what happened with, you know, with Afghanistan in terms of leading up to the attacks and the immediate consequences. Um, I briefly mentioned, you know, mentioned Iraq before, uh, you know, before 2001. And now I'd like to turn to uh, Iraq in the wake of 9-11. Um, when George W. Bush came to power, uh, he was surrounded by an intellectual group known as the neoconservatives. These, these were people who basically believed in the power of American military action to remake the world. And they had a particular focus on remaking the Middle East, uh, in order to advance what they saw as the interests of the United States and Israel. Uh, they were publishing papers on this in the 1990s. Uh, so then September 11th, 2011, you had this attack uh, that, that the intelligence community pretty, er, pretty quickly realized this is, you know, this is probably bin Laden. You know, this is bin Laden operating out of Afghanistan. However, uh, these neoconservatives within the Bush W administration were pushing for an invasion of, you know, of Afghanistan. Internally, this was going on from uh, almost September 12th. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, publicly, the real push for, uh, for an invasion of, of Iraq really took off in fall of 2002. Publicly, the reasons given were that uh, you know, uh, Saddam Hussein was somehow linked to Al Qaeda, and that uh, Iraq still possessed some hidden weapons of mass destruction in violation of the UN resolutions that had ended the Gulf War back in 1991. Um, we now know, of course, that both of those claims were false. Um, Another claim turned out to be false as well, namely that American forces would be welcomed 